afternoon and welcome to day two of the eighth annual ECS Forum on Justice and Opportunity. I am Cynthia Muse, a proud member of the ECS Board of Trustees and the Board Level Advocacy Committee. Thank you for joining us today as we continue to gain insights from dynamic advocates for systemic change. I hope you had a chance to participate in yesterday's kickoff session to hear three of our neighbors tell their stories of struggling in poverty in Philadelphia. Those stories and enlightening conversation between Charles Blow and Sherry Gregg will soon be available on your Hoover app for you to view in case you missed this inspiring session. Now, I am pleased to introduce Kiva White. Kiva will serve as our moderator for, take for today's session on seeking a clear path to racial equity in Philadelphia. Four years ago and last year, Kiva was featured in two of our forum's most popular and insightful sessions. Kiva and his multidisciplinary team of university professors and licensed social workers have joined forces to provide professional development to workers in America's schools, childhood welfare organizations, as well as healthcare and other private and public social service entities to help them provide better outcomes for all. Thank you, Kiva, for moderating this important session today. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for that warm welcome. I appreciate that. Hey, look, I'm honored to be making my third appearance here at ECS Forum on Justice and Opportunity. And I just wanna say thank you to ECS for uh, sponsoring this platform to have these very important conversations. You know, there's a lot of words out there that describe the conversations that we're gonna dive into uh, as courageous conversations, crucial conversations. In my opinion, the bottom line is these conversations are very necessary. So I like the word necessary. They are necessary conversations that we have to have. And today we have a rock star panel lined up this afternoon. Uh, and I think you are, our audience are gonna get a lot out of what they have to bring to, to the table as we discuss this uh, important issue around clear, a clear path towards racial equity. So I'm pleased to introduce to you our panelists this afternoon. Uh, first, we have Urban Affairs Coalition President and CEO, uh, Charmaine Matlock-Turner. She leads a coalition of organizations and committed individuals who are, and when I tell you they are disrupting and dismantling systems uh, plagued by racial in in inequities in Philadelphia, check out their website. They're doing enormous work in the city of Philadelphia. Next, we have Reverend Mark Tyler. He is pastor at Mother Bethel AME Church, and he serves as the co-director of the Power Live Free Campaign, which focuses on criminal justice reform and renewal. And I am so excited to be in their presence. Thank you both uh, so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we are really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to your insight, um, your perspectives, your wisdom, and just your, your knowledge around these topics that we're going to talk about. I want to open discuss the discussion up this uh, afternoon with really looking at the role of race in the pandemic era. You know, um, following the election of President o uh, Barack Obama in 2008, the press and the public alike, really there was this huge proclamation about America entering its post-racial era. And yet here we are 15 years from that moment, and the nation continues to find itself in the midst of racial reckoning. So my, my question at the end of uh, today's uh, panel is for our, our audience to really in, ingrain it in, into uh, your cognitive thinking is have we really carved out a clear path to racial equity in this country? Or are we still treading through muddy waters? And I'm not talking about the blue saying of muddy waters. I'm talking about the, 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 the barriers, the systemic barriers that continue to uh, exist in this country. So I want to really dive into this discussion by talking about this concept and challenge this concept of this post-racial era phenomenon. And so looking back at the last 18 months, and this is the first question to our panelists here, looking back at the last 18 months in this country, how has race affected American society during the uh, pandemic? And I would like to start off with uh, Charmaine on this question, because I know she is doing a lot in the community to, as well as uh, Reverend Tyler, to eradicate some of these issues. So Charmaine, what are your thoughts about this question? Do you think we have entered into a post-racial era here in this country? Charmaine, I think you might be muted. 
Thank you. Let's start. Much. Let's start. Let's rewind. Let's rewind yes, real please. quick. So, so I was a DJ back in the day. So let me just yes. spin that turn. Let me spin that record back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiva. And, and right. thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, and thank you to uh, everyone here at Episcopal Social Services for really inviting uh, me to be a part of this conversation uh, today. Um, I do want to take us back, Kiva, before we sort of talk about where we are, because I remember election night 2008 when I was on Ogons Avenue in West Oak Lane. And I think many of us, especially in the African-American community, were shocked that President Obama was actually elected. So the joy and energy around that time was the idea of potential. However, um, shortly after that, we immediately saw a couple of things happen. One, there was a sense that, okay, um, we're post-racial, so everything is okay. So anybody who raises anything as it relates to race wants to go back and they don't ultimately want to go forward. And um, we saw the media, think tanks, um, politicians all sort of saying, okay, we are in a different place uh, than uh, we know uh, that, that we are uh, and were. And so I would just encourage us to take a little time to remember that because we make substantive change, and we have, we, we've been working on these issues for 400 years. So it's not like we just started 18 months ago. We've been working on them from the time that um, people of color were here, as well as indigenous people who were marginalized as a part of this um, expansion. We have been working on these issues and making some progress, but we've got a long way to go. And we won't get there if we just look at a couple of signs here and there and say, okay, there is something positive that's happened. So everything is, is now okay. We've got a lot of work to do around really understanding racism, really making sure that the broader community understands the systemic nature of racism, and then the role that all of us play and ultimately what we say at the coalition with Reverend Tyler's help and support, we need to end racism. And it can't be done if we pretend that it doesn't exist. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for that, for your perspective on that. And one of the things that I hear you say is this, this, this word end. There needs to be, we need to progress towards, and I think a clear path towards racial equity is that word end, that there, it doesn't exist in this country. It doesn't impact uh, marginalized groups, uh, whether they're Black, African American, people of color, Indigenous populations, that is an end to this, right? And um, so, and I, I believe in order for us to get there, we really need to emerge from this pandemic beyond what we call performative gestures, right? This, this, this thing called performative in nature and how whenever there's an incident, we see a performance, a high level of interactivity and reaction from the community and from political uh, figures in our country. But how do we begin to move beyond, and spe specifically in this pandemic era, how do we move beyond performative gestures of racial equity and work towards a more concrete and transformative actions? That, and this is a key, actions that are intentional. It has to be intentional. Um, and so just wanted to get your thoughts about that. And then I wanna hear from uh, Reverend Tyler as well. How do we, what are your thoughts around moving from performative uh, action uh, or performative nature to a more of transformative intentional actions towards racial equity? Well, I think we have to be uncomfortable with being, um, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That, um, you know, if we sort of come together and we have, and, and I applaud everyone who's done great things. I'm glad to see that Dr. Stanford is here with all of the terrific work that she's doing in the community that kind of work and the investment in that kind of work is absolutely critical. So we always have clear work that needs to get done. But the part to me that sort of continues to miss us is we have to really be truthful and honest about the history of our country, what happened. There was a thing called slavery. It really did exist. We did move people of uh, indigenous people out of their communities and take over their land. We did continue issues around segregation, lynching, all of those things existed. It doesn't mean that there weren't also people who are a part of the power movement, which is a multiracial organization, 
who have been a part of helping to solve some of those kinds of problems as well. So, but being truthful and honest about our history helps us understand how do we get to, to ending racism. And taking the time to read and study is just absolutely critical. So I know a lot of times we say, you know, I used to call people like AOPers, like articulators of the problem, and say, let's get, you know, let's get things done. Let's let's come on, let's move some things. But I now really very much appreciate the fact that if you don't know it, if you don't understand it, I don't think you can change it. Wow. Wow. That's real powerful. I think uh, when you talk about history, you know, and, and there was a lot of effort to eradic eradicate critical race theory. And I think it's important and in critical race theory, it really talks about racism as ordinary and how it's very important that we embrace the history of racism in this country in order for us to be begin to eradicate it. We can't, no longer can we put it underneath this carpet or put this veil of silence or shy away from it. We have to address it head on have these crucial conversations and like you said, get to work in veteran um, um, systems that tend to perpetuate uh, racial inequity in this country. Um, Dr. Ayla Stanford has uh, joined us and I, I thank you so much for uh, being a part of this discussion, uh, Dr. Stanford. Uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Stanford is a pediatric surgeon and the founder of Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium here in Philadelphia. Uh, she's done uh, enormous work working to bring testing and vaccines to more than 75,000 residents of the Philadelphia minority neighborhoods. Her work is exceptional and is mo most needed here. So uh, we welcome her to the panel discussion. And uh, Dr. Stanford, we were just talking about this, uh, you know, this post-era phenomenon uh, or this thought process around or post-racial era thought process that has permeated in this country since uh, the election of Barack Obama in 2008. And uh, we were just talking about how uh, we can move from a performative gestures to more of a transformative action and, and intentionality to um, eradicating racial inequities in this country. And so uh, after uh, Reverend Tyler uh, responds, I want to get your thoughts on this as well, because I know you are on the front lines of all of this uh, pandemic uh, era uh, stuff that we're talking about here today. So Reverend Tyler, what are your thoughts about moving from performative to transformative intentional action? Who could be famous? Yeah, so uh, let me just say that, uh, first of all, I wanna um, express my appreciation to uh, Episcopal Services for the opportunity to have this conversation. And I'm always glad to be with Charmaine, who's my board chair at UAC. And uh, Dr. Stanford, uh, my wife and I, your sore, have been um, fans of yours and supporting your work uh, ever since the beginning and couldn't be more proud um, for you to be out there representing us this way. And so uh, Kiva, as I'm thinking about this, you know, it, it's interesting that this conversation is happening a day after the passing of Colin Powell, Secretary, former Secretary of State, um, you know, Chair of the Joint Chiefs, four-star general uh, from humble beginnings. Uh, we talked about him this morning on our radio show and his legacy. I think people, even before Barack Obama, people were beginning to think with, you know, his appointment in Joint Chiefs under the first George Bush, then later Secretary of State, that somehow we had, you know, we had come to a new place in America, only to discover that, you know, the party that put him forward was, you know, really never really prepared, has not yet, I should say, demonstrated um, a willingness to really do the dismantling of the systemic, you know, issues in our um, culture that continue to keep us, you know, I mean, we're, uh, you know, I guess you can almost say we're still separate, but unequal. I think a story just came out today that Philadelphia is still one of the most segregated cities in the country. Uh, I don't know if anybody had a chance to see that, but it's a fascinating map just showing how, how deeply segregated physically this city still is. And so um, performative things, I mean, we're not, we haven't even perfected the performative. <laughs> there are two black NFL head coaches in the NFL, where most teams, the players make up 70 to 80%. And, you know, and yet none of them seem qualified or capable to actually even lead one of these teams after their playing days are over. And yet people get jobs, uh, I won't call any city out, who have never even played the game and yet they're head coaches. You understand? So we ha we're not even doing the performative well let alone the real work of dismantling the structures and systems. When you think about inequality and how baked in the system is, I'll give you one example. 
story after story keeps coming out of people who are trying to um, sell their homes or to get home equity out of them. And when they're Black families, they'll call the appraiser who comes out and undervalues their homes. And so their neighbors are selling their homes for 500,000 and somehow miraculously their home only appraises at 350. That's real money. Yet when they have their white friends or neighbors come over and replace all of the photographs in the same house and do nothing else except have their white friend purport to be the owner, allow an appraiser in, the appraisal jumps up miraculously and is on par with the neighbors. And so we, you know, we still have systemic issues like that that are helping to drive the wealth gap in this country, that are helping to drive the education gap and every other significant gap that we're talking about, whether it be health, uh, housing, or whatever. And so I'm not interested in any more um, performances. I'm interested in real change. And real change will not happen until you do what Charmaine was just talking about, by confronting the issue, hiding, by denying the fact that slavery happened and banning CRT, critical race theory in schools is not an answer. One of my favorite preachers in the AME Church is the Reverend Dr. William Watley, who's in uh, Decatur, Georgia now, who has a famous sermon that's just simply entitled, you have to face it to fix it. And if you don't face it and deal with this squarely, you will never fix it. If I we're a part of the, you know, um, kind of the descendants of people who did to our people what has been done, I would be ashamed of it as well. And I probably wouldn't want to hear it either. But denying it does not make it go away. It continues to kick the problem as a can down the road. And we will not fix it until as a complete society, we stop and deal with it absolutely once and for all. Wow. You said, you said a lot of things. Yeah, I'm a sports fan too, uh, Reverend Tyler. And one of the, you, you mentioned about the lack of coaches, African-American coaches. I did some research uh, and, and out of 150 major league teams in this country, only one is owned. And so we're talking about this disparity or this disequalization of ownership. Only one out of 150, now these are a billion dollar organizations is owned by a person of color. And that is the great Michael Jordan. And so I, I, I say, I, I, I applaud you for bringing that up because I think when we talk about systems, we're talking about the pandemic and of course it's gonna to allude to um, medical systems and uh, you know, healthcare systems, but there's other systems in our society where there's a huge disparity and huge disequalization around wealth building mechanisms. So I really appreciate you raising that issue. Um, uh, Dr. Stanford, so what are your thoughts? We're talking about um, how uh, in the past 18 months, have you seen any, how has race affected American society during the pandemic? And I know you, you could uh, go uh, for hours on this topic uh, in the work that you do, but share your perspective about this, because I know you've been on the front line assuring that uh, communities of color receive vaccinations and testing. So what are your thoughts around this? Have we moved the needle? Have the class, has the path become clearer to march for us towards uh, this concept called racial equity? Your thoughts? So first, I'm excited to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, for me, it's the exact question that you posed about performative gestures that I heard 19 months ago that I said, I'm not just going to be on a panel talking about it, talking about social determinants of health, because people were dying in real time. And so that was my uh aha moment, if you will, to say it's time to be intentional, it's time to be transformative and change the narrative that Black people are dying at a greater rate from coronavirus disease and say, okay, here's a problem. There is no cure. However, testing and contact tracing will save a life. So how do I get that to the people who need it most? Well, I go to them which in medicine doesn't happen. You know, too often our academic institutions say, well, we're here, we're open 24 hours. If you want healthcare, come see us. And that was the answer. And to Charmaine's question or to her point or response about you can't forget the history of how and why our health outcomes are the way they are, they're deeply rooted in lived experiences and historical things, not just theories, 
but things that actually happen to people and happen to our elders and ancestors. So just saying, I'm here, come to the hospital to get a test, which by the way, when you went to the hospital, you were turned away, right? It didn't stop the spread. And so for me, after I asked enough city, state and federal folks, how can I help as a surgeon? Cause we're not operating right now. And I got crickets. I said, I'm not sitting home on my couch. I'm not sheltering in place. I'm gonna figure out what I can do in real time. So for me, that was my intentional, purposeful, even down to the name of calling us the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium. And that was because I wanted the name to connote a certain level of trust because people didn't know me. And a lot of folks assume, oh, cause you're black and I'm black, I'm gonna trust you. But that is not the case. You know, Give us a little bit more credit. People have to earn trust. But I wanted the name to at least uh, create a bridge a little bit, right? And so that's where the name came in. And of course the black church. I mean, the black church is one of the few things that we have almost always owned that we could call our own. So when I reached out to the different churches, they didn't have to get permission from the city or from the state to say, yes, sister, come here to my parking lot. Yes, you can use our electricity and our Wi-Fi. That's why we were able to move so quickly because there was not a huge, you know, sort of bureaucratic set of barriers for us to push through. It was literally by us for us, right? Um, but specifically with medicine, you can't do it alone. So right now when, and it's already started to wane, I'm sure you would say yourself, the uh, emphasis on access and health equity and the veil that's been lifted because of COVID with health outcomes, um, you have to capitalize that. So for folks who are genuinely interested and have deep pockets, Ask them, how would you like to turn it into action? So it's sustainable, this feeling that you have. And so we're opening a Center for Health Equity November 1st, ribbon cutting next week because it wasn't enough to put a shot in an arm and do a test. That's just a band-aid. We know that the health inequities have existed for year, hundreds of years. And the only way to get to better outcomes is to be a clinician reflective of the population you serve in the community so they can walk from their house, get a bus and get expert care regardless of how good your insurance reimburses. So from my perspective, that is my contribution to uh, intentional action and transformative change. And, and it's just the beginning. And again, I think for our folks who are not black and brown, who feel as though, you know, we're taking something from them somehow, somehow to take care of those more vulnerable means you're taking away from someone else. No, that's not, no one's saying that at all, but we are recognizing that past injustices and current systemic processes lead to our poor outcomes. And it doesn't mean I'm taking away from you to provide for those who need it, Okay, but this is what's necessary um, in our city and in our nation. Um, so. Wow, wow! You said you said a whole lot of things that I could comment on on, on, on like <laughs> 10, 10 key pointers. You said that, but the one I really want to focus on is the word sustainability. Mm -hmm. that, and so I think in terms of being uh, moving from performative to more transformational, if we're going to transform systems, we have to have sustainable processes in place. So I applaud you for opening up that center. Because sustainability, in my opinion, it leads to returnability because you have you have access and then you have affordability. But if, if we need people to return to continue to get quality health care. So that returnability factor has to be in place. It has to be in the community. I think the racial matching that you put in place with the Black uh, COVID-19 Doctor Consortium, that helps with the returnability because that helps to build trust. So keep up the keep up the great work. We appreciate all that you, all of you are doing. Uh, in this arena. And because my mantra, mantra that I was always talk to, told was, we can't talk about it, we have to be about it, right? right? We That's can't right. talk about it, we have to be about it. And the three mm -hmm. of you, are, 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 as, as the rapper would say, y'all about it, about it, y'all are doing what needs to get done in our community. And so with that, I really want to move to the next question, because it really talks about how you all engage, like how do you describe your level of engagement in this work? 
um, your daily pro, uh, promotion uh, and, and, and promoting racial equity, which position do you tend to operate from most? Advocate, ally, or accountability agent? When it comes to er eradicating the racial inequities in the city of Philadelphia, and if you, we're not, we're talking about, we're not just talking about it, we're being about it. And how do, how, how do you go about your daily work as advocate, ally, or accountability? Brief rapid response on that. We'll, we'll stick with you, uh, Dr. Stanford, since we have you at our presence. <laughs> Man, it's Wait. all of the above because you cannot do it um, by yourself. You can't, but you can certainly hold people accountable. And when other people do wrong, use that as your leverage to move forward while you're doing right. Insert Philly fighting COVID. Let's not forget that. Um, but obviously uh, the city has way more money than we have with our donations and corporate sponsorships. So you need allies and the people need someone to advocate for them you know, to step out and, and speak about the things that are being done wrong in our city. So how would I describe myself? Honestly, all three, because none of us can do this by ourselves. You need the ally and you need to be a voice for the voiceless. Awesome, okay, thank you so much. Charmaine, what's your primary uh, marching orders in, in, with respect to these three terms? Eva, I wish I could disagree with uh, Dr. Stanford just so I could create a little debate, but, uh, but seriously, no, I, I think, we do them all. I mean, the reason that the Urban Affairs Coalition has been around uh, since 1968, founded at that historic and very heart-wrenching time when Dr. King was assassinated, was to really bring people together and try to find places for us to work on critical issues of concern. And that you can't do it by yourself. You have to have partnerships and you have to have allies. I think one of the things that I've seen during this time when Dr. Stanford says, you know, she came on the scene, she wanted to build trust. So some of us who sort of like been around, people were like calling, like, do you know Dr. Stanford? I said, yes, I do. She's a member of my church. She's a fantastic woman that, oh, you do know? Yes, give her money. She is going to do a phenomenal job. And I stand there to say I am an ally. Um, and so I think the idea that when you're in positions where you can ultimately be an advocate and a supporter is to remember that you have to be there to talk truth to power when you're at powerful tables. So you have to use the influence and power that you have in order to make sure that we're promoting an ecosystem of change. And so when you're promoting an ecosystem of change and black leadership, that is absolutely critical to us being, I think, really, really focused on driving change. Awesome. I, I like that term, ecosystem of change. Um, and with your permission, I, I will jot that down to use that in, in one of my upcoming trainings or, or teachings. That's a powerful statement. Thank you so much. Uh, Reverend Tyler, what are your thoughts? Where do you, where do you, are you on all three planes or do you have one specific that you start out the gate with and then the other components just kind of meld itself into um, your actions? Yeah, I think just by the nature of what we do, um, all of us probably blend with all of them. But I would just simply say that the area that I work with most uh, as a part of power, um, you know, again, Philadelphians organized to witness and power and rebuild uh, now Pennsylvanians instead of Philadelphians uh, and our work with Live Free. Uh, which is, again, focused on police accountability in particular. Uh, so obviously for me, it is about holding these systems accountable. So uh, I once said to a certain um, police commissioner at one point during my stay here in the last 13 years, uh, I won't call uh, his name. <laughs> I said, you know, you, when I said, I think that you need civilians at the table as you're making policy, because after all, you're the policy that you make at the table is being lived out on us to which, you know, he, you know, just kind of like um, shrugged and said, I'm not going to have civilians at the table. And I said, well, you know, when you start buying your own bullets and buying your own guns and buying your own police cars and your tanks and everything else, you know, then you can make your own rules. But as long as you get all of those things from us and the power to police us, we give you, I mean, you know, we have given consent to allow this to happen. Don't forget the social contract. And so you don't get to just do this, you and a mayor and you and a city council. 
the people who are going to suffer or benefit from what you do have the most at stake and should have the most say. And so, you know, I'm all about holding these systems accountable. Elected officials don't always like it. Business leaders don't always like it, but it is what it is. And so if you don't stay in their face, then they're just going to keep doing what they you know, what they do. And so someone has to do that. So I'm proud of the work that power does. And um, so we don't always get invited to do a lot of uh, blessings of meals at prayer breakfasts, but we kind of wear it as a badge of honor. That's awesome. I, I see some of my colleagues in the chat there as well in the <laughs> yeah. attendee list. Well, I, you know, as part of, as part of leadership, one of the things, uh, you know, a characteristic of solid leadership is vulnerability and being out, being able to step out there on the ledge and say and do the things that most people are not willing or not capable to say and do. So I applaud you for standing firm, uh, for being the voice of the people. That's very important. It's a concept, not, not nothing about us without us that has to hold true in every aspect of this work. So thank you so much, uh, Reverend Tyler. We appreciate that. All right. So, hey, I mean, there's no way you can engage in this type of work with this type of topic. Anytime the word race is involved, it, it seems like it, it cringes people. And there, you know, there, there are barriers that I can only imagine that the three of you have faced. Some of you have kind of shared some of that uh, in your responses to um, the earlier questions. But what I really want you to really hone in on one specific obstacle or barrier that you have encountered over the years of doing this work, right? Because I think this will be a nice teachable moment for other leaders that are on the call um, to be able to identify these barriers or obstacles and then offer a strategy that you have used to overcome that barrier? Um, you know, the, how, how were you able to overcome it uh, in dealing with the racial inequities that you face? So what was an obstacle or barrier? And then how did you overcome that obstacle or barrier offering a teaching, teachable moment to um, our listeners today? And let's start, let's keep it here with Reverend uh, Tyler since you are on screen and then we'll move down the line. Sure, I appreciate it. So I would just say, um, so our, again, I work with Live Free. I'll use one of our most recent, what we view as a win. Um, so during the um, during all of the uprisings of last summer, one of the things that city council came out with, council member Curtis Jones, uh, was to abolish the Police Oversight Commission, the PAC, as it was called, um, which initially was already, was always hopeful that it would give oversight, but never really had oversight power to replace it with the Citizens Police Oversight Commission, the CPOC. He put it on the ballot, it passed, and now it's it's actually moving. I'm actually on the selection panel to um, nominate the first nine commissioners to city council. It has real teeth, it has real powers, um, and it is about accountability. It's not perfect, but it is a tremendous step forward, and it has a budget. The Police Advisory Commission had a budget of less than 600,000 a year, to try to do accountability. This new um, oversight board or commission will ultimately have at least 13 million when it's up and running and continue to grow. That is transformational. They're gonna hire investigators and people. So if you are harassed or something happens to you, you can actually go to them. They'll be able to investigate it and be a part of the disciplinary process as much as the contract allows. Now, while you know we celebrate council member Jones taking that forward, that was a demand that Power Live Free placed on his desk, city council's desk, and the mayor's desk in December of 2019. Malcolm Jenkins came alongside us at Arch Street Methodist Church. We had 30 or more organizations show up with us, and they all co-signed among a list of demands. And what I want to say to leaders who are here, I remember vividly that day we left City Hall and myself and my co-director, Elder Melanie DeBose, laughed saying, this is going to be a five or 10 year fight to make this one happen, to get rid of the pack and get real oversight. Nobody saw the pandemic coming. No one saw the tragic death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, whose trial, that trial is happening this week. And their sacrifice of their lives made that become a reality in one year as opposed to five to 10 years. And so what I say to people is, you have to cast the vision, write the vision, and begin organizing toward success, even though it seems impossible. Because if we didn't have those demands already on their desk, what they did in that crisis moment, council began reaching for demands that community groups are already calling for. And that's what made it easy. That's what made it accessible because we'd already laid out 
what should happen. And so I say, don't let the impossible stop you from dreaming. And we have to dream of a better city, or as we say, a city of opportunity that works for all. We have to dream it and see it and write it out, even though it looks like it'll never come to pass. Mm, wow. So it's this cognitive, uh, it's cognitive first before it can become the action oriented. You have to think it through, write it down. You think it through, you write it down, and then you do it. It sounds like that's, that's the strategy that you're, you're offering here today. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Charmaine, what are your thoughts? Uh, a barrier, and then how did you, how were you able to overcome it? All right, well, I'm going to take us back a little bit um, because, sure. I mean, certainly um, there are clear barriers that still exist, but I want to remind us of some of the work that's been done in the past because a lot of times, again, if we don't know history and if we don't understand the past, we are, as they say, destined to repeat it or we ignore the lessons that came from that. Uh, coming out of the uh, student movement um, for me and out of uh, questions of uh, really uh, looking at the end of uh, trying to end the Vietnam War and, and trying to end racism and discrimination against people of color, um, I came back home to see young people around my age then in their early 20s saying that if we're going to have an impact, if we're going to see the kind of changes we want in communities, we also have to understand power. And power certainly is about being a terrific advocate, building our own institutions, but we have to have political power as well. And so we need to start getting involved and engaged in helping people to run for office. Um, at that point, uh, the late uh, great um, Senator uh, Hardy Williams, a standout uh, Penn State basketball star, had gone on to law school, came back to Philadelphia, ran for office, and actually won a state house race on uh, the late David P. Richardson Jr. Again, a great family from Germantown, um, ran and won for the state house. And then I had a friend, John White Jr., who decided that he was going to run in what was known as the East Mount Airy Cedar Brook community and invited all of us who went to West Philadelphia High School with him to get involved and to get engaged. What I thought was important about that effort as we look at driving change today is that we spent a lot of time really studying and learning the system. We knew how to register voters. We knew what were the tactics that were gonna be used by those who opposed us we knew that they also had the power of the police department and could use the police department against us in order to harass us, to keep us from doing that. We also knew that we had to get out and build trust in the community and talk to people that this was about bringing about a power change. It wasn't just about changing faces in high places. And so we spent a lot of time learning studying and then doing the work consistently over time. So when you look at the political structure today, though not perfect, that early work of really beginning to build on understanding power and how power affects the issues that are of concern to us. We, when we were young, we saw that and continued to try to push that forward. And I encourage us to think about when we hear that next generation, on the Black Lives Matter movement and others. This is the next generation to drive those levels of change as well. So keep talking to that next generation, the young people about what they're learning, what, how they wanna drive change, how we can be supportive, but give them the power in order to be able to get us to that next level of ending racism. Wow, uh, you know, as I hear you uh, share that about the power dynamics, uh, recognizing and being educated on it and how to, uh, you know, fight to kind of um, uh, address the disequalization around power dynamics. The, the irony of that is how do we get people that feel powerless to feel powerful? Mm -hmm. And I think what you just described is very important for us to start at a younger age. Uh, I know I do it with my children all the time. It's just, you know, it's, it's okay to be but assertive. You have, Let's to just... out, you have to get out. You have to go door to door. I mean, yep. We did, I took my baby out 
every Saturday, okay, where we did motorcades and we had, at that time, we had maps of the community. We had every house identified. And our goal was to hit every house twice. Wow. This is who we are. This is what we are here. And you will see us and you will hear about us. So this is not just something where we're just sort of, it's a nice thing to do. Um, you know, we'll get on television or something. No, we are committed to this work in the community and we're going to be there. And people respond when they see that you really have a commitment and you're consistent in your behavior of really engaging them and they can see results um, from the work that you, that you do and that you bring to the table. Awesome. Consistency in your presence evokes a sense of power. I like that. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Stanford, any barriers uh, that you want to share and how uh, that how you were able to overcome them? I know you shared a, a few of them, but just honing on one specific. There, were, there wouldn't be enough time on this call. Exactly. exactly. I, would, I would say the most pervasive theme or obstacle was people underestimating my ability and underestimating what we were capable of doing. Um, and so often assuming we didn't have a plan. I mean, and literally told you, oh, you're an interesting thing people are talking about right now, you'll be gone tomorrow. Like literally said that to me or um, different institutions saying, that's great what you're doing. It's clear you wanna be in the community. Why don't you let us manage your nonprofit and we'll pay you a salary and we'll take care of everything. No. I. Don't think so, you know, or um, I know you might have problems getting reimbursed from insurance companies. We'll handle that for you. But no one's stopping to ask what I might need, um, but rather assuming that I didn't have the infrastructure for us to be permanent and present consistently, to your point. And that happened over and over. So what I would say to the folks that are saying, you know, people aren't pushing me at a younger level, it might be, well, because their expectations of you are so low, they're not pushing you because they're like, why make the investment? Because you're not going to, you know, amount to anything substantial anyway, right? So how do you solve that? Excellence, excellence, striving hard for excellence every single day, being the first one up, as they say, the last one to leave, being committed, being more knowledgeable in your, your uh, skill set, and your field than anyone else, never being caught off guard, um, and hard work. You know, one of my mentors used to say, hard work will solve 90% of your problems, and the other 10%, you just have to let go of. And I still carry that to this day, keeping my head down, focused on the mission and goal, not being deterred by other things people are trying to put in your way, and staying focused. And then, even though, uh, Let's see, how can I say, it? even though others did not recognize our work initially, um, the media recognized it, the people recognized it. And so, and it was a measurable outcome to Charmaine's point. And so you could see that more testing was happening in previously in communities that didn't have testing. You could see that the positivity rate was going down. You, could, you knew that African-Americans were getting vaccinated more from us than from anyone else in the city. In fact, Bloomberg reported that more African-Americans have been vaccinated in the city of Philadelphia percentage-wise than any other large urban city in the United States. I will take full credit for that, okay? Um, and so when you have those outcomes, people start to come to you. I mean, folks kept saying, well, who's your publisher? You know, how are you getting so much media attention? Never had a publisher, never had a publicist, never had someone calling CNN or MSNBC or someone to say, hey, can you do a story? They came to us because the data that's reported from the city, from the state is reported. They can look it up like anyone else can look it up. So it goes back to hard work. Unfortunately, either because of overt bias or covert bias, oftentimes people don't see African-Americans as being the achievers. It's okay to have one every now and again, but not consistently overachieving or superseding your majority colleagues. And so 
I work against that all the time. I don't compare myself to other people. I set my own bar to what success means and what that is. I know my limitations, but I know my strengths. Um, and you decide what success means for you, not what other people claim that it is. So biggest obstacle, people underestimating our ability. So it took a lot longer than I would have liked, a lot more barriers that we hit. Um, but then knowing that excellence, so what can you do? You be the best at what you're doing. The absolute wow. best. I don't care if you're wow. doing hair, you have a bit, That's you're right. digging ditches, whatever it is, don't let anyone say that someone is better than you. And you just outperform, outperform yourself, mm. right? Not That's the person right. next to you, you outperform you. So every time you know you speak, you work, you're striving for excellence. And to me, that's how you overcome the obstacle of someone having low expectations because every time they'll have to stop and say, huh, I guess we were wrong about that. You won't yeah. have to say anything because your work speaks for it you. Speaks for itself. That's powerful. Uh, so I, I hope the illustrators are capturing all of these, uh, all these what I call knowledge nuggets because these are good strategies and you know this whole concept of execute with excellence is just a powerful statement just how do we overcome it we have to execute with excellence and i will add another thing that i hear from you dr stanford we must by any means necessary keep our hands to the plow we got to keep forging forward forging forward knocking down those barriers so thank you so much for sharing that i'm writing this down myself execute with oh, wait, excellence. and one more thing and charmaine alluded and reverend tyler you got to bring people with you. You got to bring yeah. the next generation with us, right? Yes. It makes no sense. We're not legacy building if we're not bringing the next generation. You know, 10, 15 years from now, I won't be doing this, but I got to right. have the next nurses and doctors and business folks in here doing the work. And my job is to build it for them. So all mm -hmm. you have to do is come and work. And that is another key part that goes back to the sustainability and how we stay permanent. Awesome, awesome. Well, I wanna make sure we have enough time to get to Q&A. So just uh, on this last portion here, we wanna definitely have a call to action for our audience members. And so just a quick round robin uh, for each of our panelists, what would you recommend to our audience members to help promote a sense of social justice in their community and our workplace? Uh, if you can provide an example of how your organization is paving the way towards racial equity, equality, or justice, that will be great. Round robin quick, as my wife would say, muy rapido. Uh, Charmaine, let's start with you. All right. I mean, I've talked about the ending racism partnership. We, after the assassination of George Floyd, my wonderful friend, Reverend Mark Kelly Tyler, called and said, okay, Charmaine, what are we doing at UAC um, as it relates to a really... Uh, as an organization founded on uh, equity and fighting for racial justice, what are we doing? And so we said, let's come together and let's listen and hear so that as we put an agenda together, we can build the best possible uh, constituency around this work because Mark knows he's gonna have to be the co-chair at least for another 35 or 40 years. So we've got to uh, get a lot of people to help him. Uh, to be able to do this work uh, along with me and others, but really building, um, as Dr. Stanford said, the next generation of people to really, you know, ultimately take on this work. So that's been really critically important. The other thing that we've been doing is really trying to make sure that we share with people whatever room we're in, that this is a critical time for us to make a pivot and begin to drive change uh, in the right direction. Um, I encourage people, you know, if you got a book club, you know, get together and read The Some of Us um, so that you can begin to understand and have shared knowledge about the history and where we are. And The Some of Us reminds us that this is not a zero sum game. It's not like if you help people in North Philadelphia, all of a sudden you're gonna hurt people in Montgomery County. The cost that we attribute to helping is really the opposite. We are spending more than we should because we don't have the right kind of healthcare supports that are on the preventive side to make sure that those things aren't happening. We don't have the right kind of efforts 
in across our entire education system so that everyone is working and productive and able to take care of themselves uh, and, and their families. Um, so we've got to talk, we've got to share, we've got to show up. We can't like, okay, it's not in the headline anymore. Um, we have to be there and stay the course on this. We cannot give in or we cannot give up. And finally, support each other. We talk about the challenges that exist, but one of the things that I love is we should also talk about assets in our community. There are things, whether it's been the black church, whether it's the mother's club down the street, whether it's the community activist who has brought kids together and gotten them off the corner and ultimately built structure around for their lives. We have tons of assets. Take the time to share those, celebrate them so that there is not a sense of hopelessness. All of us are doing a lot with not enough resources that we should all have, but darn, we are working hard, as Dr. Stanford said, yeah. we are getting a lot done. And so take the time to share those stories, especially with young people who say, does any of this make a difference? Heck yes, it does. Wow. So sharing of stories, sharing of resources, collaborative efforts. Those are our call to actions uh, by uh, Char Charmaine Matlock Turner. Uh, Reverend Tyler, what about you? Uh, any, any specific call to action to the audience this afternoon? Yeah, I would just simply say that, um, you know, while all of us have, you know, partners and folk who go with us, um, you, you're never going to get everybody. And so if your excuse for not starting is you're waiting for more people to show up, you just have to start. Sometimes you begin with a very small group and sometimes it stays small. You know, power, um, you know, it, we are an interfaith group, interracial, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, um, and other faith traditions as well. But you know, there are thousands of houses of faith that are that represent those three traditions in Philadelphia. Our group has less than 100. And in the last 10 years, we started with nothing but just an idea, knowing that we all love this city and we viewed a city that could actually be better. And so we've been able to move real issues on education and on climate, on wages, on voting, and all the other things I talked about with uh, the Live Free campaign. And so, but when you're, when it's a small group that is organized, that is tight knit, that has one another's backs, you can move mountains. Um, last, yesterday I received word that one of my mentors, uh, the late uh, Reverend Love Henry Welchel passed yesterday, now he's the late. Um, but Dr. Welcher was my religion chair at Clark Atlanta University as an undergrad. And, uh, but he was a CME pastor. And I didn't know this till last night when I went back and looked at some video of him on YouTube. He pastored in Birmingham in 1962, right out of seminary. And he said that he was the vice president along with Fred Shuttlesworth, who was the president of what became known as the Birmingham campaign of the civil rights movement. That yielded the letter from, to, you know, from the Birmingham jail by Dr. King, and also sadly, the four little girls who were blown up in the church, such a significant place, you know, um, for, for the civil rights movement, Birmingham. But he noted that there were 400 black churches at that time, and less than 60 of them were affiliated with the movement. We look back with rose colored lenses and think that everybody was involved when it wasn't. They didn't even have a fourth, you know, a fourth of the churches weren't even a, a part of it. And look at what they did. They changed not only Birmingham and Alabama, but the world. And so, again, I say that if you have a few people who are committed to making a real change, don't wait. Start. Others will join you, but you'll never get them all. But that does not mean that you can't change the world. Wow. So start. Don't stagnate. Start. Just get just just like the Nike commercial, just do it. Don't get stuck in paralysis of analysis. Get your people together and then execute, right? I, excellent. And Dr. Stanford, I would I would take uh, if it's okay with you to take your your theme of execute with excellent ex excellent as your call to action for this portion, unless you have something in addition no. you wanted to add to this part of the discussion. That's fine. That's fine. So people can ask their questions. Um, awesome. But I would say, because we need allies and you need allies with deep pockets that often don't look like us, is have an example of systemic injustice. 
when you talk to them, when they, oh, this is over, we're post-racial America, just give them an example. Because some often people say, I don't have a racist bone in my body. This uh, hospital or this place, there's no one who's racist here. There's no one who does that. Give them an example, a real life, real time example, and let them see it through your lens. Because so often people believe it's not there, but show them something that's tangible. And then they can see why you're continuing the fight. And you might get an ally to help you. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's 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 a, a good segue into our Q&A session because uh, one person did ask, how do we have necessary conversations with the opposition? And the opposition is in quotes. And I think that's, Dr. Stanford, you just gave a powerful uh, example, you know, a powerful response to that, a portion of that response is to give an example, show folks what that looks like. Other panelists, what do you think about this question? How do you have the necessary conversations with the quote unquote opposition? Any well, I, I'm not sure about, uh, you know, I, I like to gather uh, people who are on the fence and the willing. Um, you can spend a lot of time with people who are just absolutely 100% opposed to you. And that, in my opinion, doesn't really sort of yield what you're looking for. I'm looking for those people who are almost there, who need a little bit of a push, who are lacking the stories or the information, who are looking just a little bit. Maybe they're the first generation. I just put a, a person on my board who I won't name, who comes from a generation of a family that he's, he will tell me is absolutely racist, but he's the first to sort of like, because when he went to school, he started seeing things a little bit differently and just start pushing out a little bit. As soon as I saw that light, I grabbed him immediately and said, come join my board. As a matter of fact, you're gonna be my board buddy. And we're gonna spend time together. I've had him in my community. I've met his kids, he's met my family. So the idea was to try to really create a, a positive relationship. And so if we have him, then that means I have him now being an advocate in rooms and in places where maybe I don't have uh, an ultimate opportunity to go. The other thing is, is that I, about five or six years ago, was talking to a friend of mine at a meeting and I just said to him, I said, by the way, when you have like a party at your house, how many black people are there? And he said, mm -hmm. I said, don't feel bad. Ask me if I have a party at my house, maybe I have one or two white people there. But when I look at my social network, it is still very much the people I went to college with, the people I grew up with, because as Reverend Tyler said, we, we've been a very segregated society. And so what we agreed to do was at least a couple of times a year, look at people in our networks and we brought in one other person. And so each of us invites someone who doesn't look like us to dinner, no more than 12 people. And we talk about race, but not from a policy perspective, really from people's personal perspectives to try to build those allies and supporters through their own personal life experiences and to have a table where they can ultimately feel comfortable doing that. And I'm happy to say that we just had one a couple of weeks ago. Um, and again, people were feeling excited about it. One member went home, talked to her daughter. Now her daughter who's in high school wants to figure out how to bring people together, both black and white, to have uncomfortable conversations. So there are, there are all kinds of things that I, that I think that we can do. Um, as Reverend Tyler said, you know, let's just, let's just do them. And if they're good, we'll expand them. If, if not, we'll look at maybe some way to partner, but we can't give up on this. We have to end racism. We must. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that, Charmaine. I know in recognizing and being mindful of the time, I do want to pose one, one final question from the audience. Um, and that is, do you, do you see healing included in the path towards racial equity? And if so, what does that look like or what could it look like? So we're talking about this clear path of racial equity. So do you see healing included in the path towards racial equity? And if so, what could it look like? Yeah, um, so I'm not sure if you were directing that to anybody in particular. Yeah, it's just I'll, open, yep, this is the last open invitation, yep. Yeah, so I mean, listen, I, I would hope that at some point, you know, Dr. King, who's sitting over Charmaine's shoulder there, um, you know, always preached and taught about the beloved community, which is, I think, 
really kind of getting at, you know, that the, the heart of that question that we would become a community and society where um, that's possible. Uh, I mean, you know, th these last few years have, uh, I think, really been a shock to the system and a wake up call for a lot of people. I don't think any of the three of us uh, who are panelists or even you, Kiva, are really surprised by what we've been seeing. We've probably all been saying it in our own circles. People were in denial. But, you know, there was something about Barack Obama's ascendancy to the president that just, you know, pulled the mask off of everything and has, you know, so these last 12 plus years, um, we've seen that there are a lot of people who are just unwilling to go there. Um, and so I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I, I, the, the preacher in me wants to hold out hope for it. I'm, I'm certainly not sure that it will ever be something that we will see completely in, you know, our lifetimes, possibly for our, you know, grand and great grandchildren. But, you know, until the country again does, you know, sits down and deals honestly, and that means dealing with not only how we got here, but also questions like reparations and making people whole. I mean, you can't talk about healing without making people whole, right? And so, we're, you know, we're not when so these inequities that are here are are part and parcel of everything that happened in all of the years prior to the last 50 or 60 <laughs> prior to the last 50 or 60. This country was not just simply divided, but it was legal to do all of these things. Mm -hmm. And it was propped up by the by government as well. So, I, you know, again, I, I'm not sure. And um, but I will just simply say I hold out hope that all things are possible. The preacher in me says that, um, but my head says something um, different, at least in the foreseeable future. Got it. Well, let's all hold on to hope. Uh, as Reverend uh, Tyler just indicated here, I just want to thank everybody for all the panelists. Thank you so much for being a part of this uh, courageous or crucial conversation. Uh, I would be remiss not to uh, just say thank you on behalf of Victoria Bennett, uh, who is ECS's uh, Chief Inclusion and Advocacy Officer. She wanted to personally thank you all for lending us your time, your expertise, and your insight to this uh, conversation this afternoon. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to Cynthia to do some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kiva, Charmaine, Dr. Stanford, and Dr. Tyler. The work you are doing in Philadelphia is certainly making a difference. We need to become more uncomfortable with being comfortable. We need to move beyond being the AOPers, the articulators of the problem, and be understanders of the problem. We need consistency in presence because presence evokes power. Those most at stake should have the most say. We need to promote an ecosystem of change. Phil, help, we need to help people and helping people in North Philadelphia does not mean that we're hurting people in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. You do not need a large group to take action. And lastly, as Kiva says, don't get stuck in the paralysis of analysis. We have identified four specific actions that you will be hearing about throughout the week. Those actions are described in detail in the ECS Advocacy Action Center, which you can access through your Hoova app. Click on the exhibitors section on one Hoover to access our advocacy action booth. Voting rights are a fundamental to racial equity. So I want to highlight our call to action on voting rights in the Action Center. You will, you, uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, tomorrow there is to, going to be a procedural vote on the Freedom to Vote Act. So be sure when you visit the Action Center that you uh, tell your senators to pass this critical piece of legislation. And then lastly, you will not want to miss tomorrow's session on smoothing out the benefits cliff. Bill Farron, one of my colleagues on the Episcopal Community Services Advocacy Committee, will moderate tomorrow's session describing one, the nightmarish benefits cliff. 
Two, the negative impact on those trapped in poverty and our overall economy. And three, the possible solutions. Enjoy the afternoon.